a few reasons. I'm going to move around because I have a lousy knee. I'm going to move around because I'm nervous. And it's easier to talk when you can move around. And I'm going to move around because I'd rather be closer to you so we can talk with one another. This isn't about me lecturing at you. This is about me talking with you about stress. So I'm stressed out right now doing this, right? It's hard to get up in front of people. You guys didn't give me any direction. How do I go? Arrow, there we go. Come show me. There we go. So it's important for me, when I talk about stress, to understand where I'm coming from. So I'm stressed now, talking, I mentioned that already. But that's a different kind of stress. I'm nervous, I want to be good, I want to give you information you can use, I want to give you information you can take home with, I want to make sure you understand what I'm trying to get across. That's stressful, I want to be good at what I'm doing. It's a very different stress when you hear those three words that no one wants to hear their physicians tell them, you have cancer. That's a whole different type of stress. And that kind of stress, that's a stress that causes distress. That's what we're going to talk about today. So when we talk about distress, distress, oh, and by the way, I understand there's quite a few people online Zooming with us, so I'm really pleased and thank you for joining us. But when we talk about distress, we want to talk about a common reaction to cancer. Because if you're not stressed when you hear those three words, something's wrong. Something's wrong. That's always going to cause distress and concern. And you want to feel like you can handle problems in life. That's what we do. But when we hear something when we feel it's completely out of our control, that's where the stress and distress comes from. Maybe we can handle this. Maybe it's going to be too overwhelming. Maybe I'm going to die. That doesn't feel good, does it? And so we had a look, we want to look at. Where does the distress come from? Well, it can be mental distress, it can be physical distress, social, spiritual, or it can be a combination of one or three. The idea is how do we cope with that? We can't cope till we know what causes distress. So we know if we hear we have cancer, we're distressed or we're stressed. But we also know that it can be for a lot of different reasons. It can be practical. How am I going to get to my treatments? You want me to start radiation? Wait a minute, radiation is how long? How many treatments? How many times a week? How am I going to get there? Have you seen the prices of gas lately? Seriously, I work in a place where some of our patients are driving over two and a half hours. We're out in the California desert. That's a lot of gas to and from every day if we can't provide uh, lodging for them. So there can be practical issues, financial concerns. We just heard a whole discussion about new and exciting treatments, some of which may be difficult to get insurances to cover, co-pays meeting premiums, meeting deductibles, paying insurance premiums. So there could be a lot of different reasons. If we understand what the reasons are, then we're better informed and we're better able to cope. But we also know that it affects how we feel. How we feel. How do we feel day in? How do we feel day out? And again, recognizing how we feel and labeling and naming how we feel allows us to move forward. So I, I don't need to read through this list to you guys, do I? And to you caregivers that are in the room, you know what this feels like. For me often, and I am a cancer survivor, one of the biggest emotions I experienced was loneliness. Because I would sit in a room and I would look around and before I was diagnosed, I'd be part of that room and part of that discussion and part of those people and part of that party and part of whatever it was after and during diagnosis, I'd sit back and think, wow, don't they know how I'm feeling? Sure, they're having a great time. <laughs> I'm over here trying to figure out if I'm going to live. It's a very different feeling. Life changes. I don't like that term new normal. I'm a social worker by training. This is not normal. Don't tell me it's normal. Having cancer isn't normal. And when we're identifying all those feelings and trying to figure out what to do with them, we also have to address, which sometimes in this day and age of, um, what's the word I want to use, being appropriate, saying the right thing at the right time, is that we still have a generation of men, it's changing a little, 
But we still have a generation of men, their husbands, their fathers, and those roles for them are protector. So we're identifying all these feelings, but this generation of men also, while they're aware of the feelings, I don't know, they might not want to share them as quickly or as readily as others might. So when we also talk about distress, besides talking about being aware of those emotions, identifying them, what are the causes, what can I do about it, what's my role as a father, a husband, a brother, a best friend, a protector, we're also going to talk about if you don't attend to that distress, you're at risk for depression. I enjoyed hearing our doctor at the end of her discussion bring up the term depression. She was linking it to ADT uh, therapy and the higher incidence. But the truth is, if we don't attend to what's causing us the distress or the stress, we're putting ourselves at risk for depression. So I think it's really important, very quickly, and really easily, you know, people often say, I facilitate a support and information group, or an information and support group, I like to call it. We'll talk about that in a minute. What are the signs of depression? It's simple. Great highs, great lows. Eating too much or having no appetite at all. Sleeping too much or you can't sleep. Sad, irritable, hopeless. And the feelings get bigger every day. So you get the, get the message? It's this, it's big highs, big lows. When you start to feel that, that's a warning sign. And that's important to pay attention to. So what do you do about it? You live with it, you do. There's a diagnosis called post-traumatic stress syndrome. We know about it. We first identified it. We have a lot of vets in the room, I'm sure we do. We identified it through those who'd gone to war. But the truth is a cancer diagnosis also, also can provide, and there's a lot of research in this right now, post-traumatic stress disorder related specifically to having a cancer diagnosis. But there are things you can do. There are simple things you can do. There are important things that you do and that you can share with others in your life. So I'll talk about them, but I'd like to ask any of you, since you're all sitting here, I don't know if you're cold. I was cold when I was just sitting. It's also why I like moving. What do you do for your stress? How do you, what do you do? You know those feeling in the pit of your stomach or you wake up in the middle of the night and go, okay, yeah, right. What do you do for yourselves? Anyone want to share? Eat. Eat. Yeah, me too. I hear you. What else? Anyone else? What else do you do for your stress? Hi. Run. Run. Good for you. You've been a runner all your life? Uh, since I was 30. Okay. Well, is that half your life or you don't want to tell us your age? It's okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, good for you. Yeah, I had a father who was an athlete. I think he used a lot of his uh, uh, running, or even in his later years when he had Parkinson's, you'd see him out there like this. He was moving. I think he used that for his stress, too. What else? Where are you? I don't see you. Oh, there. Sorry, the lights are in my eyes. What is it you do? Get outside the boundary of the four walls. Get outside the four walls? Yeah. Yeah, good for you. Pray. Pray. Amen to that. Thank you for that. Works very, very well, especially for us believers. But what's really fun about prayer is how much it works for non-believers, if you could just get them to do it. Good ideas. Thank you. So I have some tips as well as thank you for sharing. It really does make it easier when you join me in this. But I have some uh, things I'd like to share. Tips, ideas. How do you reduce the stress? Well, the first is, <laughs> surprise, surprise, let's set some limits on news and social media. The constant barrage of information 24-7 that comes at us is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. I know I just, um, I'm here, my sister's with me, which is really a delight and a pleasure. Um, she's making fun of me. She's my older sister. Right? So she's allowed to do that uh, sometimes. Um, but I constantly have the news on. I am constantly turning the TV on. I open my eyes, the TV goes on. I reach for my phone. It's a constant cycle. And you know, we just went through three years of an incredible experience most of us had never lived through before, which was a pandemic. The news was unrelenting of the pictures of people in the hospital, 
right? It, was, it, it just didn't let up for just a moment, the war in Ukraine. Again, there are vets in the room. How does it feel after you've served and if you've been in combat to be, see constantly those pictures of the Ukraine and what's going on there and in the cities there? And now we have the earthquakes, Syria and Turkey. It's just constant this at you. Take a deep breath, turn off the TV, turn off the news. Just take a break. You should be informed, I'm all for that. But take a moment and walk away from it. I think that'll be very helpful. The other thing you can do for simply reducing stress, and I know I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna get in trouble for saying it, and I don't care, I'm gonna say it anyway. Women are way better planners. I'm not sure why, we just are. We tend to have three calendars, and we have everything written down on everything, and I encourage those of you who don't do this, it really makes a difference. When I say in our information and support group, well, what kind of daily planner or calendar do you use? I kind of get this, huh? It's so helpful if you could just keep track of what you do, when you do it, and give yourself time in between. Because we all have limits, but when we have cancer, we have more limits. And some of us, I know I was like this, some of us, we were gonna prove we didn't have any limits when we had cancer. Because it made us feel in control. I can do this. I got this. Watch me. But the truth is, when you have cancer, your body's in a fighting mode. It's trying to keep you healthy. It's trying to do the best for you. So you really wanna make sure that you set limits for yourself and that you can say no sometimes. It's okay to do that. Be clear on what you can do and what you can't do. And then ask for help. Ask for help. I'm so aware that I used cartoons and you had all these physicians all day with these graphs and these, you know, and here's a little social worker coming using her cartoons. But it, the truth is, you have to learn to ask for help and know when you need it. And why do you need it? And again, if you use that calendar and prioritize what happens first and what you need to get done first, it'll help you manage the time and it will lower all that stress. And for me, the most important thing is sometimes there are things you can't control. One of which is you can't control that you've got prostate cancer. You can't. So if you recognize that and you're more flexible, figure out what you can control, what's within your world, what you can schedule, what you can manage, what you can say yes to, what you can say no to, you're taking a huge burden off yourself right away. And sometimes the only aspect of problem you can control is how you respond to it. Which isn't like this. But that's because I'm an old New Yorker and that's what everyone looked like when they were sitting in traffic and yelling. So there are also strategies that you want to know about and use. Some people here shared with us running, right? getting outside, prayer. Those are great strategies, by the way, and thank you for sharing. So exercise has been mentioned numerous, numerous times. There is a new study, and it's really not new because I learned this when I was in school for many years ago, but there are newest studies showing the relationship between exercise and lowering depression. There are huge studies. There are big, big cohort studies now. There are lots of people. And the way you used to exercise, you can still run. You're a runner. That's great if you're a runner your whole life. That's terrific, or since your 30s. But that's great, whatever you could do. But for many, you can't do what you used to do for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's the treatment you're in. Right? Makes you tired, slows you down. Maybe it's your age. Maybe it's bad knees. Whatever it is, and especially if you're in treatment, this is especially true. Change what exercise means to you. Depends how you feel. With those patients who are getting heavy-dosed chemotherapy, usually not prostate patients, we say to them, you know what? Walking from the kitchen to the front door, that's exercise. Good for you. Do it two, three times a day if you can. For you, what is it? 
Is it walking to the mailbox and back? Is it walking to the corner? Is it walking around the block? Whatever it is, something I just discovered, having gone back to walking, is I listen to podcasts. Helps me walk a little bit further every day. It does make a huge difference in how you feel and how you cope with your treatments and how you view life. The other is, are you making sure you're scheduling social activities? Many folks, when they get first diagnosed, and then also when they move through treatments, and we know that prostate cancer is a move through treatments for many, might start with one treatment, move to a next, move to a next. So it's really important because we tend, when we get news that's overwhelming, to do this, to pull in, to retreat, hunker down. But it's really important to manage stress and your well-being and the distress that can often come with a cancer diagnosis by scheduling some social activities, which is much easier to do nowadays with Zoom, et cetera, to those of you who are joining us via Zoom or calling. And many, thanks to the pandemic, many things have gone virtual. So when I was doing the slides for this and, and looking out, I was really surprised to see how many things have gone virtual. Uh, book clubs, meditation, yoga, tai chi, lots of different things you can do online for yourself. And we talked about this. Um, there was a question earlier today, I hope most of you, someone was asking about nutrition. And um, I, I think it gets a shrug often. Um, or, oh yeah, that's important. And then, uh, we're on to the next topic right away. I think that's unfair. I think across the board for well health, nutrition is huge. But I think especially for us cancer patients, nutrition is vital for a variety of reasons. Um, if you're treated in a cancer center, ask for the nutritionist. Most cancer centers have one. If you're in a private practice, where's your local NCI designated cancer center? Where's your local nonprofit cancer center? Usually they welcome their community members regardless of where they're treated. Get an appointment with a nutritionist. Google a nutritionist online. Make sure they know what they're doing. You're more than welcome to reach out to me. I'd be happy to hook you up with some people. But how you eat and what you eat, you are what you eat, is that like an old 60s, 70s thing? But it's really true. And it will help you terrifically. The other thing about this is this is one thing we can all control, isn't it? Because when you're diagnosed with a cancer diagnosis, as most of you know, it really feels like everything's out of your control. Doctors are telling you when you have to go where. Nurses are telling you this. Nurse practitioners are telling you that. Your significant other's telling you something altogether different. It can be very frustrating. We can control what we put in our mouths. And then this is a new field. For those of us growing up, there was no such thing as sleep medicine or sleep doctor. We never heard about that. Well, this is very real and a very important form of medicine. And it's really important for helping managing stress, distress, depression. And there is something, believe it or not, called sleep hygiene. It's really simple when you think about it. Do some reading or meditate. Well, let me, let me back up a minute. How many of you have trouble sleeping or find yourselves waking up? Yeah, yeah. Me too, me too. These are great tips if you don't already know them. Whether it's to read or meditate before bed, if we have some time, you guys from zero let me know. <sighs> Breathing exercises, I'm happy to share some with you. Work beautifully, they're really simple. You don't have to do them as loud, I'm wearing a mic. You don't have to be loud about it when you do them. Um, a routine is huge. Regular time to bed, regular time to get up. Um, we were also talking about this earlier. Keeping a regular routine. Um, I, again, learned about this in my training, but I also work on a campus that has the Betty Ford Hazleton Center. Um, and I checked with them, and I was delighted to hear it's still the same. Do you know when folks go into recovery, alcohol, drug addiction, et cetera, one of the first things they learn is a routine. Get up, make your bed, brush your teeth. So I think routines are hugely important for sleep. I think they're important, again, for control issue and to keep you moving forward. And then alcohol. 
So y'all hear the newest study from the American Cancer Society? Did you? Any of you? So it used to be that for women, four ounces a day, and for men, six ounces a day was okay. I didn't love it, but if you're gonna drink that, and it didn't matter if it was beer or wine or hard liquor. That was it, right? And, you know, we were joking earlier again with my sister, and I'm like, well, I'm six feet tall. Like, can I have the six ounces a day? Because I'm like the size of a lot of guys. This, this is not fair. So that was okay. And no, you couldn't save it all up and just drink all of it on Saturday night. Now, yeah, and it was across the week by the day. The American Cancer Society just released its newest study. There is no alcohol that is good for you. So I am not telling you, I know, look at the faces, right? I was like, sure, thank you very much. The scotch at the end of the day means a lot, and it does. So I'm not telling you not to drink, that's not my role. I wouldn't do that, but I am encouraging you to look at how much you drink, when you drink and why you drink, and have a discussion with your physician about that. And that whole thing about resveratrol and want, red want nonsense, sorry, not true. And then, of course, avoid electronic device. <laughs> Look at your face. I can't keep stuff looking at you. You're like, what? <laughs> and then um, I'd like you to see the way the words are written up there. Join an information and support group. Um, I have been facilitating a prostate information and support group for almost 21 years. And I do a breast cancer group, and I do a multiple, multiple myeloma and blood group. That's the only social work I do nowadays, but it really is important to me and I hope helpful. Support groups need to be informational. They really do because information in and of itself is where your support comes from. When you understand what's going on with you and your treatments and how they work and why they work and what you need to do to ensure that they work, that's supportive. And yes, of course, we should talk about, hey, how are you coping? What would you do when this happened? Gee, you know, you're really at it with your significant other all the time. You two are not communicating well. Your kids are trying to drive your life and tell you exactly what you should be doing and where you should go for all your treatments. We want to talk about that, too. But I really, really think it's important, and again, especially for men who are like, I am not going to this support group. And listen, everybody's sob stories, I'm just not interested in that. And I'm not talking about anything. I think an information and support group is really important and really helpful. It gives you information, it helps with myth busting, which happens a lot. We heard again earlier today, that was a very good presentation about what's going on in the internet and how we get information. And it builds community and compassion, which also our presenter today from the American Cancer Society can Cancer Action Network. Wasn't that a great presentation? I just really enjoyed his presentation. And he talked about community and building community, as did our head of our board, our prostate board, share with us what it meant to be part of this community. And all of that should happen in an information support group and happen here at zero. So these are write it down, learn a new hobby. These are just all little things you can do. Write it down. How do you feel? How are you feeling today? Journaling is an incredibly helpful way to move someone through an experience that's traumatic and stressful. And keeping that routine. There are some tied and true relaxation techniques. If you don't know about, there are a lot of apps too, for those of you that use apps in your phone. My favorite is Calm, C-A-L-M. If you haven't used it, please check it out. It's superb. It has music. It has some exercise. It has suggestions. It has guided imagery. But there are different relaxation techniques, and every one of you can do these. You don't need someone to tell you how to do these after the first time. You can do these. OK? Whether it's, and they lower stress, they lower your blood pressure, um, relaxed or deep breathing. That's in through your nose, out through your mouth. It's not this. You'll wind up on the floor. You'll pass out. It's just slow, easy breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. That, you can do that anywhere, anytime. There's mental imagery or visualization. Guided imagery is what it's called professionally. Pick a place, any place that you love to be, and walk through there. 
drive through there, ski through there, whatever it is you do. I had led a class, again, I was sharing this earlier. I had led a group in guided imagery, and because I'm a water baby and love the water, I started with, picture yourself in the ocean. And of course, there was someone in there that had almost drowned swimming. That was not very relaxing for her. It was a bad choice. So I don't tell anyone anymore what to do. Pick what you like. For me, it was golf growing up. It was a family affair. Me, my parents, my sister, my, my son was a good golfer. My girls didn't golf. But when I'm having a new scan or something's going on with me and I can close my eyes, I start right from picking out the golf outfit to putting on the shoes, to driving to the course, to taking my clubs out, to driving up to the first tee, to putting the tee in the ground. Whatever it is, I never get past the first hole and whatever scan or whatever is all done. It's very helpful and these are things you can do for yourself to manage that. And progressive muscle relaxation. This is really terrific and you start at your toes and you tighten your toes and you loosen them. And then you go to the arch of your foot and you tighten it and you loosen it. Then you go to your calf and you tighten it. And you'd be amazed, amazed how much better you feel by the time you get to your head. You can't tighten your head, but you can tighten things on your face. Tomorrow, some of you going to the hill? Are there are a few in here of our advocates. Well, I was concerned that some would be, and we are doing a presentation. I hope you'll join me tomorrow on caring for the caregiver. It's a marathon, not a sprint. But I wanted to make sure people had some of this advice. So for the caregivers in the room, and the patients, so you know and understand, and I hope you do, what they're going through as well. You know, you want to do everything you can, but you also want to be respectful of your partner. You want to ask them permission. Is this okay? You want to write things down. When you have questions, write them down. Help them write them down. Keep that pad and pencil in the kitchen where everyone can get to it, not at the bedside where they have to crawl over you to write a question. You want it where everyone can write their questions. Children, grandchildren, whomever, and take those with you. So that, and then, by the way, when you take questions to the doctor, make sure you prioritize them so your important ones are on top. Because I don't know about you guys, but I don't get a whole lot of time with my doctors anymore. So you want to make sure you those, get those important questions answered. And then you want to ask, can I help you take notes during your appointment? Maybe you want me to take notes during your appointment. Maybe we, maybe we can ask the doctor, can we uh, tape record our appointment so we remember what the doctor is saying? There's a lot of, we're, we're pretty smart. There's a lot of very smart people in this room, but those abiraterone, those words are long. They kind of meld together. It's really helpful if the doctor is comfortable with you recording what they're sharing with you. And then also, for caregivers, if driving back and forth is too much, now with this day of COVID, and the, um, to be honest, it's also about reimbursement. Physicians are reimbursed for telemedicine visits. That hasn't gone away. You can ask, can we do a telemedicine visit? Would that be better? You can make that suggestion. And remember that bad days are normal for all of us. They just are, and allow someone the room to breathe through a difficult day. But that doesn't mean they can be abusive or angry or wipe the, wipe the floor with you verbally, but let them the space to do that. And respect, um, uh, often in one partnership, there's the talker and there's the non-talker. It's rare to have two talkers because you never get through anything. So we tend to have one talker and one ta non-talker in a relationship. Give your non-talker the space to not talk. Be careful of throwing those old bricks. You never talk. You never tell me how you're feeling. Give them that space for a while. And of course, as caregivers, there is a lot you can do. And when you do this, it relieves and lowers that stress and distress immeasurably because then you're a team, and you're moving through crisis together. And that's hugely important and significant. So before you move, any questions? I'm doing all the talking real quickly. 
Okay. So the takeaways for you are this is how we react to stress. We may do all of them. We may do some of them. We may be two of them, three of them, maybe three of them together. But take away from this, we talked about difficult emotions, and we talked about sometimes people have a hard time expressing those emotions. So seek out someone other than your partner that you can share them with. Again, if you're in a cancer center, you've got a social worker. Community cancer centers, National Cancer Institute cancer centers, university-based cancer centers have oncology social workers. They're trained, they're master's level healthcare professionals, trained to have discussions with you, to work with you and through some of this. Perhaps, and I'm sorry, I, when my slides transitioned, my pictures kind of got in the way. Perhaps it's a pastor, or a spiritual advisor, or counselor is the best person for you to talk with. But it's important to, and here I talk about a little bit about what social workers do do, and how they can be helpful. And then that takeaway again is social. Make plans, reach out to the point that you can deal with them. Don't become a hermit. Stay engaged and involved. It also, when we have cancer, it becomes all about us. You notice that? It's the focus is on us all the time. If we get engaged and involved socially, it stops being the big focus on us. It's on other. And that's really helpful to mitigate distress. It really is. And then we talked about this. Exercise is huge. And certainly, financial is a big issue for many of us. Triage cancer, um, is Joanna speaking today or tomorrow? tomorrow? Tomorrow. You want to go to this. Trust me, this is a great presentation. I've heard it numerous times. Triage. Um, Cancer is a great resource for you, and they partner with Zero. Anything I've talked about, Zero has the references, the information, how to get there, how to get that help. Take advantage of that. And then uh, I'm always amazed when someone comes into group or comes into any of the programs we offer at our cancer center, and they say, gee, I wish I'd known this when I was first diagnosed. This is great info. Thank you. And first of all, I'm delighted, as are all my colleagues, that we're able to provide that. But then I think, where do we go wrong? Because we have posters, and we have flyers, and we have ads in the newspaper, and we have online. Where are we going wrong that people aren't knowing all the support and information we can provide? So I really urge you, when you go to where you were treated, this is a little different in private offices. I get it. But you can just go to the Zero website, to the American Cancer Society website, Cancer Care, one word, cancercare.org website, and get this information. But I urge you to look around. Don't have tunnel vision when you go to get treated. What's being offered where you are? What signs are up? What posters? What flyers are there? Who can you ask for information? And certainly connect with Zero. This is the time to build your team. This is the most important time to build a team. And you have them. You have every one of you has a team. You may not identify that team. You may have trouble at times communicating with that team. But you all have a team. And if you feel like you don't have the right team, Zero is here to make sure you get the right team. Because no one, no one needs to or should ever walk a cancer journey alone. All you have to do is ask. My words of wisdom. Any questions? We had enough today. It's been a long day. Then go and have a lovely evening. And thank you. <laughs>